So again, in a free fall problem, if you're near the surface of a, of a planet or a large moon, the acceleration due to gravity is a constant for all objects, regardless of their size. Who needs that repeated? All right, good. So now be aware, close to the surface sounds pretty arbitrary and it, it kind of is. As you get further away from the surface, uh, the acceleration due to gravity does get less and less and less, but it takes a while. Uh, the, the International Space Station is experiencing almost the same acceleration due to gravity as we are on the surface of the planet. The only reason it looks like the astronauts are floating is because the space station is actually falling towards the Earth the whole time. It's just that it's moving sideways fast enough to not hit the Earth, a phenomenon we'll talk about when we talk about orbits. But the reason that astronauts look like they're floating, it's kind of like a cartoon thing. If I put you in an elevator and I cut the cord, the top of a tall building, you and the elevator fall at the same rate because the acceleration of gravity for all objects is the same. So you would float inside the elevator until, of course, such time that the elevator stops, in which time you will stop too. So when we deal with accelerations, I want you to be aware that this actually extends out pretty far. So if you're at the top of a very, very tall mountain or you're in a, in a low valley, you're all experiencing roughly the same acceleration due to gravity. Now, each celestial object has a different acceleration of gravity. We're mostly concerned with things near the surface of the Earth. So the accepted value for the acceleration of gravity near the surface of the Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. And I'm gonna, I know this is obvious, but I'm going to put it in here anyways. This acceleration points towards the center of the planet. In the classroom, when we actually do the acceleration of gravity lab, we're probably not going to measure 9.8. Real problems that deal with free fall also tend to deal with air resistance. And so we have other phenomenon that will prevent us from ever really getting 9.8. In fact, in the problems in your homework, I don't even want you to use 9.8. Just use 10. We're not going for accuracy here. Not in the way you think. The difference between 9.8 and 10 is not enough to change the accuracy of your answer. We're talking about less than 2% difference. So people would think that they have to use 9.8 because it makes their answer more accurate. All of these problems are fake. Right? We're not including lots of things that are actually happening. You're learning how to deal with these numbers. And you're not trying to get some super accurate answer. But I want you to understand something that unless you are told differently, we will use 10 meters per second squared for the acceleration of gravity near the surface of the Earth. But just be aware, every object that you could possibly stand on, like the moon, which is like 1.6 meters per second squared, Mars is six point something meters per second squared. Later in the year, you will learn where these numbers come from and how they're calculated and what causes them. But for right now, the only one you need to memorize is to understand that the Earth is 9.8 or 10. Any other time, you'll be given the acceleration. But you need to be aware that we treat it like a constant acceleration and that's always directed downwards. We're going to use a lowercase g as the symbol for the acceleration of gravity. Regardless of what planet we're on, we'll always tend to refer to it as g. But I want in your notes something very clear. Do not assume g is negative. g is a vector and it is directed downward. If you complacently start just assigning negative to this, you're gonna have problems in the future. G shows up in a lot of places because we do so many things inside a gravitational field that we end up seeing G a lot. So don't assume it's negative, just assume it's directed downwards. That will save you a lot of heartache in the future. So I want to do at least one sample question to kind of give you a feel of what these problems look like. I'm pulling one more or less right out of your homework. And 
I'm hoping that I'll get the kind of question I've been getting surrounding this problem for the last couple times I've used it. You're standing on the ground and you throw a ball upwards at 10 meters per second. How high does the ball go? I'm doing a slight modification to the way I did this problem in the other class because I want it to be a little different. So you have two different va values. But I'll say it again. I throw a ball upwards into the air. And I'd like to know how high does the ball go? That's really all I have to say. If it's an acceleration of gravity problem or a free fall problem, you've been given enough information. The first thing you need to do is determine whether you know if the acceleration is coming from gravity or not. In this problem, I think once the ball leaves your hand, we can assume gravity is going to slow it down. That's what the problem is about. So a free fall problem feels like it gives you less information because you have to bring to bear whether the object is being accelerated by some outside entity or is being accelerated by gravity. Once the ball leaves the hand of the thrower, it's gravity. So we start this problem off the same way we start all the other ones off, kind of giving us a, some room to go. I'm gonna identify things that I know. What's something I know about this problem? Yes, sir? The uh, starting velocity is 10. Starting velocity is 10 meters per second. Now, somebody in first period indicated that the initial velocity was zero and that the final velocity was 10. And there might be somebody in this room who feels the same way. So do you understand that that's not what the question is about? It is true that in your hand, an object, if you're gonna throw it, starts at rest and then you accelerate it. But that's a separate problem than what's being asked. We're not asking about the time interval in which the ball was accelerated by your hand. We're asking about the time interval that takes place after the ball leaves your hand. Do you see that these are two different problems? So you need to discern which problem is being asked. So I'm pretty sure we're talking about what happens after the ball leaves your hand, when you're no longer acting on it and just gravity is. What's something else we know about this problem? Yes, sir? Yep, this is an acceleration of gravity problem, so the acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. Need one more piece of information or we can't solve it. Go ahead. If I want the maximum height of the ball, I'm finding a point where the final velocity of the ball is zero. That should give me the maximum height of the ball. Yep. From this point forward, I would ask you maybe to do a brief sketch. If not a brief sketch, you need to indicate to the person who is grading your problem how you decided to deal with the vector parts of your problem. There are four vectors here. So you need to make a conscious decision to decide on the direction of your problem. Meaning, are you gonna make upwards the positive direction or downwards the positive direction? We're gonna make pos positive downwards on purpose because you generally tend to make upwards positive by nature. And I wanna make it clear to you but it doesn't matter what this decision is. Whether you make upwards positive or downwards positive doesn't change the problem. So we're gonna make downwards positive and then we're going to assign positive and negative to each of the vector values here. For example, the acceleration is downwards. I'm going to assign it positive. I know that it's assumed that there's no negative sign. It's automatically positive. I want to make sure the test grader is left with no doubt about the decision I've made. Since you're gonna acquire a point on your test for making sure you dealt with direction, you wanna earn this point with no ambiguity, right? Do something to earn this point with no ambiguity. The ball was thrown upwards, it's negative. I'm going to identify that these four things can be used to solve my problem. I'm gonna ignore T. I'm gonna find a relationship that has everything but T in it, and that's two A delta X equals v squared minus v naught squared. Now, if you do everything right, most of the time the problem will tell you the direction of your answer. Let's see if this one does. 2 times 10 times delta x 
equals 0 minus negative 10 squared. Uh, let's see. 20 times delta x equals negative 100. Delta x equals negative 5 meters. So the ball went upwards 5 meters into the air. Straightforward enough? All right. Then I'm going to change the problem. You try it, and then I'll turn the class over to you. So I'm going to change the problem. I don't know how much I, how fast I threw the ball. I would like to know how fast would I have to throw the ball for the ball to travel 10 meters into the air. Take a minute. Try and work this out. And I'll pick on somebody. Yeah, All right, quick walk around the room. I've really got the haves and the have not. I got the ones who can do it, and ones who have no idea where to start. This problem is nearly identical to what we just did. Difference being that the ball went upwards 10 meters. We don't know how fast the ball was thrown but we know that its maximum height is achieved when the final velocity is zero and that it's going to be experiencing an acceleration of 10 meters per second squared. And we've indicated that downwards is positive. So it went upwards, downwards is positive. Look, there's not a whole lot here. You're gonna to have to be able to do this. In fact, this is almost identical to what you just did, isn't it? The only reason we're doing this is because something's about to happen in this problem that I want to make sure you've seen once. So let me, um, let me encourage you to stop writing down just what I write down and write down the information you didn't know just now and why you need to know it. Why is it you didn't have this filled out the same way? What, what thing did I say that made you understand that you need to put things in different places? because you have to do these you know, on your own. And if you don't know how to write notes, this is the point where you say to yourself, well, maybe I need to learn. Um, the problem ends up being exactly the same, except for a, a little wrinkle. We're gonna try and solve for something different. Still gonna have two times 10 times 10. That's a little different on this side. I know the final velocity is zero, and I don't know the initial velocity. Now, the displacement's negative 10. I left the negative out, so I'm put that negative back in. If I don't, I'm going to have a problem. Left side's 200. Right side's just negative v naught squared. Uh, cancel the negative signs. Take the square root. We get the square root of 200, but I'm taking the square root. When taking the square root, we don't know whether our answer is supposed to be positive or negative. So you need to decide or choose one or use both. You need to be aware of what it means to do the positive or the negative. Square root of 200 is like 14. But should I make my answer positive or negative? should be negative. I want to throw the ball upwards. In fact, better yet, my choice of positive or negative is actually for me to say upward. Give it direction. Make sure you understand what positive and negative means. It's these details that are really the part of your test next week or this week that I really want to nail. Although I don't know if we'll have it this week or not. It will depend. All right.